Hello, today we'll be going over Cauchy's theorem. Cauchy's theorem can be viewed as a partial converse to Lagrange's theorem and states that if you have a finite group of order, say, n, and p is a prime that divides n, then there exists a little g inside the group such that the order of g is equal to p. There's a few different proofs of Cauchy's theorem. One uh, splits uh, first the case um, where g is an abelian group and uses induction on the size of g to um, show the claim for the abelian case and then uses the class equation to deduce it for any arbitrary finite group. Um, the proof we'll be going over today uses a, in my opinion, more elegant approach which uses um, group actions. So let's start. So first we'll need to define a set S. So define S to be the collection of all p-tuples where the g's come from uh, uh, the group such that the product of the g's is the identity element. So this is a nice set. Um, one might wonder what the cardinality of the set is and we will actually need that. Um, so we'll go over a counting argument which would uh, actually find the size of this set. Um, well, we know that if we arbitrarily pick p minus 1 elements, say g1 all the way to gp minus 1, well, and let's just leave this last slot blank, we know that the product g1 all the way to g p minus 1 this thing here is an element of the group and by the axioms of the group this element has an inverse say gp and so this is the identity so gp uh, would be uniquely determined in this case to be the identity and similarly if you have an element from the set S say g1 you know, all the way to GP, well, we know that the product is the identity. But by the um, associativity property, we know that we can associate it this way so that GP is indeed um, the inverse of this element here. So, what does that mean? That means that really this we can arbitrarily fix, I mean we can arbitrarily pick the first p minus 1 slots and it uniquely determines the last slot. Any element of s will look will be of that form. So really the cardinality of s is really just the number of ways you can pick p minus 1 um, tuples arbitrarily from g. Well, the order of g is n, so for each slot there's n choices, leaving n to the p minus 1, and you don't have to worry about the last slot because it's uniquely determined, so there's only one possible choice for that. So the cardinality of s is n to the p minus 1. So that's the first step in this proof. Uh, next, we will need to know How are we going to define um, a, a nice group action? Well, we are going to let the group Z mod P act on S uh, by the following. So since ZP is a cyclic group, we can just take a generator, say the coset 1, and we can show how one acts on um, an arbitrary element in S. So one acts on, say, an element in S, G1 to GP, by permuting this around in a cyclic manner, namely shifting GP to the front. The last one comes up and everything moves over one. So it looks like this. Uh, 
Um, and one can check that this is indeed a group action. So what remains to be seen is, well, what do the orbits look like? So um, there's a theorem called the orbit stabilizer theorem that says that the orbit, the cardinality of the orbit of an element x, in this case, x comes from s, is equal to the order of the group. In this case, it's p because our group is zp um, divided by the or order of the stabilizer of x, which is a subgroup. Well, what we do know is that the stabilizer of x, the cardinality or order in this case, only has two possibilities since it must divide p. Namely, it's either 1 or p as p is a prime. So if the stabilizer has order 1, then the orbit of x, the cardinality of that would be p. And um, if the stabilizer had order p, then the orbit of x would be 1. So we know that, um, so this implies that the, um, the orbit of x, the cardinality of the set, is 1 or p. There's only two options. Um, we also know that the group action induces a, um, an equivalence relation on the, the set S, and the distinct orbits, say, partition the set S. So if we take each distinct orbit and multiply um, by how many elements are in that orbit, then and add them all together, we'd get the cardinality of S. So rather, the cardinality of S um, is equal to, well, let's denote first, um, let U be equal to the number of orbits of size 1. And um, S is equal to the number of orbits of size P. So because of this partition, we know that if we take the number of orbits of size 1, um, which is U of them, times, well, 1, for because there's only one element in these orbits, plus the number of orbits of size P, so S of them, times the number of elements there is p, this equation holds and we know that this from what we said earlier is n to the p minus 1. Well this is just u plus sp. But p divides the left hand side since by assumption p divided the order of the group and so p must divide this right hand side well, P divides this right sum end since P is here. So that implies, um, this implies that P must divide U. So U is the number of orbits of size 1. So the question is, maybe U, has, um, U is 0. You could have 0 orbits of size 1. But it's not in this case because you can take... Um, you can take the element of S, just the identity element, um, P times. Uh, this is an element of S, and it will have an orbital size 1. So we know that uh, U is greater than or equal to 1, and... Um, P divides U, so that means U has to be greater than 1, strictly greater than 1, because P is a prime. So, 
uh, from that, we know we can, we know there exists at least another element, uh, there exists another orbit of size one. So what does that look like? So um, say this element of S, G1 to GP, has um, an orbit of size one. Well, um, that means that if I apply this action onto this element, um, well, we know from how we define the action, this is GP um, to GP minus one, and this term right after GP is G1. But because it has an orbit of size one, this is actually equal to G1 GP. Well, what is this telling us? This tells us that GP, the first slot is equal to G1. Um, actually, after GP is G1, so G1 is equal to G2. So G1 is equal to G2. Um, the next one is saying that G3 is equal to G2, and so forth, all the way up to um, GP minus 1. So all the entries are the same and we know this is not um, the identity because we can uh, assume it to not be because we know that u is greater than one so there's another orbit um, another distinct orbit so what does that do for us well that shows us so let's just call these g1s um, say it's just a g well, that means that g to the times g times g and, you know, p times, um, this is equal to the identity, or rather, uh, this notation. Well, we know that the from this, it follows that um, that the order of g must divide p but p is a prime and g is not the identity so what number other than one divides p well it's just p so the order of g has to be equal to p so this proves the result um, showing the existence of an element of order p it's a very nice proof and uh, Pretty powerful results for group theory.